And I was supposed to talk, I get, about Mr. Piketty and his many fallacies and so forth. And it's always difficult to know how to organize a lecture when you basically don't agree with any of the implications that the author has from any of the data, which, for my purposes, I don't care whether it's true or false. I'll assume that it's true. The question is, how do we start to think about it? And, and I think there are basically a couple of points that you want to do. There are sort of a first a key normative point about the question of why do we worry about inequality anyhow. And then there's the sort of theoretical question about oh, how it's going to happen sort of if you assume that the system that he puts into place can be administered in a more or less frictionless fashion. And then third, there's the question in which all lawyers delight to speak about, which is namely if you're trying to put this thing on the place, or is this going to be a dodo bird that's going to crash of its own administrative complexity, or is it going to be a sleek aerodynamic operation that you can implement with a great deal of effortless ease? I dare say it is the former, not the latter. Well, the first question in many ways is perhaps the most uh, important that one has to deal with this question is, why do we worry about inequality anyhow? And I don't mean this in a silly kind of sense. I mean it in a rather serious sense. And let me see if I could explain why. Uh, there are generally a number of criteria that can be used in order to measure social welfare. Uh, and the one which I'm going to rely upon here is the standard developed by Wilfredo Pareto many years ago. And it says when you compare two particular states of the world, uh, you are going to be able to say that one state of the world is better than the other if one person is made better off in one state of the world and nobody else is made worse off. So by definition, if you have a rising tide that raises all ships so that everybody is better off in the second state of the world rather than in the first state of the world, and then you really are in some sort of economic nirvana. Uh, what happens, however, when you start to apply that particular definition is that there's nothing about the definition which is constrained by any notion of equality. Uh, so if you assume for the sake of argument that you have a society of just two people, uh, the generalizations don't matter for this particular purpose, and they both start off with wealth of 10. Uh, what you do is you can now have a situation which one goes to 20 and the other remains dead at 10. And one can say, in effect, that's a Pareto improvement because somebody's better off and nobody turns out to be worse off. And in fact, the greater the gap that is created, so long as the first fellow doesn't go below that original baseline, uh, then in effect, the greater the level of the social improvements. So if you start with that particular definition, uh, then it looks as though equality is not the thing that you want to deal with. It's a question of moving out along that what they call Pareto frontier. And the argument easily generalizes from two people to n people. And then the question is, empirically, one would ask, is this is what likely to happen, that one will double and the other will remain completely stagnant? And empirically, the answer to that question is almost surely no, because the basic mechanism by which improvement takes place in society is not only individual labor, it's cooperation amongst multiple individuals uh, in order to achieve a common task. Adam Smith called it specialization. We could call it synergy. Doesn't matter what the term is. But essentially, the basic theory of contract is we get two people who take their material and their social resources, intellectual resources, and put them together. They can do together uh, more than they can do if they operate separately. So the neoclassical theory says your job is to minimize the transactions cost that allows them to come to better in order to maximize the cooperative surplus. And so your agenda is essentially frictionless transactions leading to systematic social improvements. The key feature to note intellectually about this particular change is as follows. Uh, you don't get people to come into a contract with you if you're going to get 100% of the surplus. So if you have a world in which you both start at 10 and 10, uh, you're not going to get a situation where you're going to go to 10 to 20. Because if that happens, the other fellow has actually no incentive to join in the situation. So what you have to assume is that both of the ships in this particular transaction are going to rise. And then the question you're going to have to ask, is there any way that you can observe or be confident that you know the amount at which they're going to improve and the relative ratio of those two things? And it turns out at this particular point we're deeply troubled because in some cases the gains that you get from various kinds of operations are in fact financial, but in other cases they're non-pecuniary, they depend upon subjective pleasures of one kind or another, 
and the measurement issues are extremely difficult. So if you're now going to try and say, oh, we're going to have a situation in which two people get married, uh, but we're not going to allow this marriage to take place unless both people have an equal level of social improvement from the transaction, what am I supposed to tell you if they're both happy? That one is happier than the other, which is probably true to some extent, and does it make any kind of a difference? So what generally the standard economist does, or the standard lawyer economist does, as it says, when you see the voluntary transactions, and you can put aside, which is sometimes a serious issue, the notions of coercion or mistake or non-disclosure or fraud and so forth, you don't care what the distribution of the surplus is. You know as a matter of general tendencies that there'll be some way in which they'll be divided so that you can be pretty confident that the whole thing will raise both ships. Well, then the question is, well, suppose these people are doing it and you have everybody else that are out in the world, and what about them? If the two of us get better and they remain below, don't we create another kind of inequality? Uh, to which there are, of course, I think at least two answers. One is nobody in the world has a monopoly on entering into voluntary transactions. So if A and B enter into a transaction with each other, it doesn't stop C and D from doing exactly the same thing. And indeed, uh, most people enter into multiple contracts at any given point of time. So if I'm entering as A into a contract with B, I can turn around as A and enter into another contract with C. And what happens is as you increase the velocity of the contracts, it turns out that the total level of the surplus increases. The distributional consequences, again, are not going to be in this stark 0, 1 uh, type situation. And in fact, what we can say is to the extent that A and B in a single transaction improve their joint welfare, that means that C coming along has trading partners who are more attractive, that is, they could offer more in exchange, so that the external effects of the standard voluntary exchange between two parties turns out to be positive. Now, how far do you want to go with all of this thing? Well, it really starts to depend on what you're trying to think about. And here there's the following distinction. When you do this stuff through voluntary transaction, and you have this entire rate of gain, the one thing that you want to be absolutely sure about is that you don't va invalidate transactions on the ground that you think you know that there's a better distribution of the gain than the one that has been actually imposed. Uh, but it turns out that there are systematic forms of market failure out there in the world, and when these market failures start to take place, the following starts to happen. Uh, there are potential gains from cooperation which cannot be achieved because the transactions costs are very high and the opportunity for strategic behavior is very large. And so if you're trying to figure out how to improve, for example, a road on which there are a thousand houses and you try to get all of the owners to bargain as who's going to pay what particular share of the uh, improvement, everybody may agree that the improvement ought to be made. If forced to do so, everybody would contribute a requisite share from which they would get a greater gain. But if you have voluntary bargaining, everybody's going to say, I'll you do it first, I'll sit around, and when that becomes universal, it's a classic prisoner's dilemma game, so nobody does nothing. And what you therefore have to do is to figure out a way in which you want to put uh, these folks together. And in classical liberalism, I think the correct definition of a justified government transaction is one in which the government forces you to pay to contribute to a venture, and you will be left better off by virtue of the forced contribu contribution that you make than you would have been made if, in fact, nothing else had happened. And so if you look at this particular situation, you have these thousand people, and it turns out you could tax each of them 10, and each of them gets 25 in benefits, then, in effect, by insisting that every boy and he join in the common venture, what you do is you create a surplus. But in this particular point, you cannot afford to be indifferent as to the allocation of the surplus in question. What you have to do is essentially say we're going to prorate the cost according to some neutral metric, which is typically either front footage or value of the part in question. So everybody pays in accordance with the formula and then they get their own private benefit. And in doing so, what you do is you prevent the competition from taking place over the surplus, that is over that 2,000 units of gain that are being generated by having a very clear kind of allocation rule. And so essentially what happens under these circumstances is for voluntary bargains, Generally, you let the surplus lie where it falls, but for coerced kinds of exchanges to create public improvements, you try to create pro rata benefits with respect to everybody to prevent rent dissipation. And so that means that there are somewhat different metrics between coerced and voluntary types of transaction. Now, what if you're an egalitarian and you're starting to look at this kind of situation? What are the implications that you have? 
Well, since all of these transactions are going to allow you to get greater disparities in wealth, because the voluntary transactions will generally dominate the coerced transactions in terms of their frequency and their relevance, you're going to have to be very, very upset about that. So what is that you want to do? Well, if you're an egalitarian, the only thing you want to do is to minimize the differences between the two parties. And the best way to do that is, once you start in a position of parity, uh, is to say either it's perfect proration in the gains or you can't do it at all. Uh, so you will come up with the position that if the gap is 2010 under the first situation I gave you, the correct solution is to ban the transaction because then you could keep the zero gap at 10. If you could find a way to raise this thing to 1212, you would prefer that to 1010. But then if you have to ask the question, do you prefer 1812 to 1212, your answer to that question may well have to be no as well. Uh, so what happens is that the egalitarian is now in the very unhappy position that the only way in which he can keep the uh, truth is to completely upset the whole range of voluntary transactions by banning them to the extent that they create wealth differentials. And then what you have to do is to understand that the least well-off under those circumstances is going to be worse off in a legalitarian world than it could be in a non-egalitarian world because when you stop the gains to the winners, you necessarily have to stop the gains to the losers as well. And it's that particular tension, that particular element, which means that the theory is largely incoherent. Uh, the strong person of it is the one that I gave you already, that when you're dealing with common expenditures, you want to have an equal division of surplus based upon the size of your original investment. But that has nothing to do with egalitarianism. That has to do with the fact that if you have a common venture, you want to treat the public as though it's a corporation. We give people shares in corporations which are designed to be perfectly fungible one to another so that when the corporation makes a gain, the identity of the share solves the question of how it is that you allocate the gains that start to take place amongst multiple persons. If, therefore, you try to run two societies, one forward under the Piketty egalitarian rules and one under the sort of open market rules that I'm talking about, it's perfectly clear which one is going to be a hell of a lot bigger. And it's also going to be clear uh, that the worst off are going to be worse off under the egalitarian system than they're going to be under the non-egalitarian system. So the question then is, what's the source of this particular criterion? Well, the only way I can see that you can justify it is to play a slightly different game. And you're going to have to say, you know what, what we're really concerned about is the fact that the, the marginal dollar is worth less to the rich person than it's worth to the poor person. And so if we could work ourselves a clever little system uh, that we would like to do, what we'd like to do is to create a system so that the last dollar has equal benefit to the two parties. Uh, the danger of using that as a general criterion is it may force you back to say that since everybody is identical, which they're not, of course, uh, then the last dollar to the first person is the same as it is to the last person, so that what you have to do is to create some kind of perfect parity in wealth again. And then people will start to say, well, you can't do that. So you're then going to have to say, what do you do with respect to disparities if they have negative impacts on growth? And you then have to develop a kind of social equation which says you could do this much redistribution, which is going to handle the diminishing marginal utility of wealth point, but not so much uh, that what you will then do is to kill the production. And it turns out this is a very difficult program to implement because first of all, we don't know at which the rate of the use of wealth absolutely starts to decay. That's not an easy thing to do. It's certainly not exponential in any significant way. And, and people find lots of uses for money as they get richer, just as they are when they're poorer. Uh, so it's a relatively modest stitch, I think, compared to uh, the desirability of particular commodities. If the world only had a good like steak and it turns out you have a thousand that you can't eat and somebody else has none, you know, a lot of redistribution would make sense. But you're talking about wealth, you're not talking about particular commodities, so the decline in its value is generally going to be somewhat lower. Uh, so the sort of weak egalitarian has to figure out exactly what the optimal rate of progressivity is, and I have never seen a credible study which tells you exactly where it is that you would want to put this thing. And in addition, it turns out that you don't have to necessarily use public coercion. One of the striking things about most European countries is they don't believe in charitable deductions. Um, against the tax code, which is at this point still allowed in the United States, but not if Mr. Obama has his way ultimately in the future. 
And the theory about the tax deduction is that the private person picks the person for whom he's going to be benevolent of the task, and then the government gives a matching grant by forgiving the tax on the portion in question. And that's actually a pretty good way to handle this situation because you don't have the huge public choice problems of having the government run the programs of redistributions. Instead, what you have is the uh, situation in which private parties monitor the nature of the gifts in question. And I'm pretty sure that for every private dollar you spend on charity, you got to spend 10 government dollars before you get some equivalent benefit out of the situation. Because those guys eventually are sort of kleptocrats, as you would expect. And in fact, they don't have very good measurement skills and monitoring skills in what it is that they turn out to do. So what you really want to do, I think, is instead of handling the inequality problem by a centralized solution, charitable deductions give you a decentralized solution. And if you look at Mr. Piketty, there's not a single word of that. He is a Frenchman through and through, and he assumes that the level of private benevolence in his perfect society is absolutely zero, which is, of course, the way in which the French encourage things by virtue of their particular tax code, which gives no assistance to the kinds of redistributions that you would like. Uh, so then going on to our second point, uh, the next question you have to ask, and I'll be quicker on the last two than I was on the first, is, you know, can this thing work intellectually? And what you have to do is to understand that Piketty is by and large incoherent on this point. Um, what he wants to do is to say that somehow or other it is okay to tax capital at a very high rate because it always accumulates, but labor, of course, is something which is really quite different, and you have to be careful. So what he does is he announces a system in which he says he wants to have an annual wealth tax on acute capital and then have a high income tax on top of that. And the argument that he makes is essentially if you're taxing wealth which is accumulated, it's past wealth that's being accumulated, so it will have no incentive effects with respect to future production. There is a terrible intellectual mistake about that because you have to go back and figure out how it was that you got the wealth that you're going to accumulate to begin with. So let's start with the simplest case. You take the great magnate, some guy like Mark Zuckerberg, who figures out how to make you talk to one another, and it's worth you know, billions upon billions of dollars. So you give a relatively low rate of taxation when he earns all of this money. But now, once this money is accumulated, you tax the dividends on it at a particularly high rate, and you impose a wealth tax on it. Uh, but if you are imposing a wealth tax in the second period, um, he's going to know this in the first period. So essentially, the tax that you impose on wealth in the second period is in fact upon tax upon the income that you put in the first period. And it doesn't take very long to see that if you combine a high progressive tax on dividends, for example, with a relatively modest wealth tax, uh, that in the end, the only thing that happens with accumulated capital is it slowly disappears into the maw of the government. So if you assume, roughly speaking, say that you've got a 6% rate of return on capital, which is high, given the fact that we have such loose money in the United States, at least, that, and in England, I might add, that it's slower than that. So you get your 6%. And now it turns out that you've got only half of it left. Now if you put a 3% wealth tax, right, that's going to just take away the rest of this stuff so that you get a zero rate of return and inflation. If there is some, will still do the same thing. So if you try to put these two taxes together, it is going to be a terrible difficulty. Now he'd say, well, well, let's at least go after the inherited wealth. Well, I don't want to go after inherited wealth. I mean, most people have pretty strong bequest motives. And if they do, then in effect, if you take the money away from their children, it is tantamount to taking it away from them because of the identity of the interest. So you're not going to avoid the disincentive problem on the creation of wealth by imposing a strong kind of inheritance tax. And so therefore, once again, I think the answer is you really don't want the discontinuity of death to alter the tax situation. In fact, I am. Uh, for the record, a fierce and long-standing opponent of the estate tax. Uh, its simplest problem is that kind of discontinuity is a terrible occasion on which to levy a tax on wealth or anything else. And it makes no sense whatsoever to say that somebody who dies at 40 pays an estate tax and somebody who dies at 90 pays an estate tax because the transmission of wealth between the two generations may be the same, although one is deferred, obviously, and the tax burdens are vastly different uh, given the deferments and the opportunity to making gifts during life and all the rest of the stuff that's going on. Uh, so I think what you really want to do is to either have an income or a consumption tax uh, which only taxes the accruals and doesn't tax anything else. So this then gets us very quickly, because I'm running a little bit over time, but not too much. Now, just a couple of minutes is how does this damn thing work when you want to put it in place? 
Well, let me start with, in fact, the first hypothetical question I received in Boris Bitger's tax class in the fall of 1966. And it was a case called Drescher against the Internal Revenue Commission. And the hypothetical he spun out of that particular case is he said, looking at my eager Yale Law School classmates, you have achieved your de just desserts, and now five years later, you are made a partner in a major law firm, which gives you a protected share of interest and profits in this particular law firm at some time. And you go out with your spouse or your best friends and you start to celebrate. You say, I've got it made in the shade before I was at risk, and now I have this contract which is protected. You look at the definitions of income under the Internal Revenue Code, and it says anything which is the receipt of cash or property shall be taxed under the code. And now it's an exciting day, and so the knock comes on the door from the Internal Revenue Service guy. And he says, I understand that you now have a vested interest in a partnership, and you know, we're going to do a little calculation. We think this is probably going to be worth taking into account all the contingencies of a million dollars. So congratulations, at a tax rate of 40%, you owe us $400,000 tomorrow. Stop celebrating and start earning. And so then what you do is you say, well, I don't have $400,000. And the government guy says, you got a capital asset, friend. Go out and borrow against the damn thing, and you can solve your problem. So you go over to the bank, and you say, look, I've got this interest. The Internal Revenue Service told you um, that it was worth a um, million dollars. So you should be willing to lend me a mere $400,000 on the strength of this thing, and I'll repay it. And the government says, wait, rather the banker says, I don't care what the government says. I'm not worried about it the estimated value, I'm a lender. I'm worried about the variance. And you know, there's a chance your business is going to go broke, that you're going to be fired, or uh, you're going to have a bad year. I don't know you're going to be able to get a million dollars. You may get more. It's not going to help me. You may get less. It's going to kill me. I can't lend you money on that kind of security. So now this person is in poverty by virtue of the fact that he's managed to achieve a partnership. So when the government comes back and it says, I'll tell you what, we'll be the lender of last resort. And we'll lend it to you at $400,000, and you just pay interest on that particular principle. And then you start thinking, well, why does the government want to make that evaluation when it's a lender? So in the end, what you always do is you simply, in these cases, defer the tax until the cash is earned. And then you could do it at either a flat rate or at a progressive rate. And you don't worry about the valuation of the particular assets that you have because with the passage of time, you'll get precise information, which means that everybody is better off by abandoning the standard definition of income and was involved in what we now call a non-recognition transaction. That is, you've realized income by getting this new property right, and we don't recognize the income until the cash is paid, which means since you took this thing in without paying taxes, you get a zero basis, which means that when the money comes in, it's all subject to taxation. Now, you, most of you know that this is the rule. Probably very few have actually bothered, since you're not tax lawyers, to figure out how this thing works. Now Mr. Piketty comes along, and he wants an annual wealth tax. What are you going to put the wealth tax on? Well, it's going to be on that partnership, right? And it's going to be on financial partnerships. It's going to be on the value of medical practices. You start putting a wealth tax on people whose human capital is tied up with the equity of partnership structures in which they're working, every year is a calamity with respect to evaluation. So you're going to have to have huge calls on taxes in order to pay the government. That's going to depress your overall income. And by the time you're done, you're engaged in a genuine suicide pact. He's not a serious thinker because he never even asked the question as to whether you should do this for anything other than liquid stocks. And the answer is, the only thing you could tax on an accrual basis would be stock because they do have clear fair market values. But if you start requiring massive sales on these kinds of things in order to pay the wealth tax, that's going to completely roil the markets. And remember, you still have to pay the wealth tax even if the value of the stocks go down, still 2% of what's left there. So you lose on the one side and you get the compound on the other side. Maybe you think, maybe he thinks, uh, that you can actually run a society in which millions upon millions of people are doing this every year. Uh, the perceived wisdom has always been if you're going to pay a wealth tax, there's only one time to pay it, which is a debt. Because at that point, the accounts are settled once and for all, and you don't have to worry about these funny future evaluations. You just make the best judgment you can. And typically, privately, somebody else is helping you out. Because what happens with the standard partnership interest at death 
is there's a buy-sell agreement either between the partners or with the operation, and what you do is you tax the proceeds that receive from the transaction. You don't have to make an invested an evaluation of what's going on. So the thing to understand is that if you're serious about how you run the world, and Mr. Piketty is not, uh, what you realize is that valuation of assets turns out to be an extremely difficult task when you're dealing with things which are not easily commoditized. And in fact, one of the huge branches of takings or eminent domain law in both here with compulsory purchase in the United States as everywhere else is when you start condemning easements and sewer lines and funny kinds of buildings and facilities, it costs thousands upon thousands of dollars to figure out what it is that the government has taken and what impact it has on the assets of the individual who are left behind. Knowing the difficulty in those cases where you have to run valuation, you don't go around asking for trouble. So essentially, if you're going to try to do this thing right, the only thing you can be in favor of if you're a Piketty type person is a progressive tax where you then have to worry about just how progressive. Folks like myself don't like progressive taxes because they can't figure out what the optimal slope is. They don't want to face the timing problems and the division of income problems that introduce huge complexities into the system. And so that essentially, if you're a classical liberal, you come down that a flat tax on all sources of income and consumption is probably the best way to start. And then you start thinking about various kinds of exceptions and qualifications with respect to capital appreciation. We could talk about that in the question, but I was supposed to talk for 15 minutes. I think I talked for 25, so I think I'll shut up. Thank you so much.